and welcome to the forum at the Harvard School of Public Health. We're here today to talk about living longer and happier lives. My name is Meredith Malnick, and I'm the health director of the Huffington Post and today's moderator. This event is a collaboration between the forum and the Huffington Post. The forum is a live webcasting series about health policy produced at the Harvard School of Public Health, which is this year celebrating its centennial. We are live tweeting at forum HSPH, and you may email your questions for our panelists now um, to the email address the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. Today's panelists, starting from my immediate right, are Lisa Berkman, who is Professor of Public Policy and of Epidemiology at the Harvard School of Public Health and is also the director of the Harvard Center for Population Development Studies. Francine Grodstein, Professor of Medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital and a research on the, researcher on the Nurses' Health Study. Um, William Mayer, Assistant Professor of Genetics and Complex Diseases at Harvard School of Public Health. And joining us later in the panel will be Thomas Pearls, who's Director of the New England Centenarian Study and a Professor of Medicine at Boston University School of Medicine. Today's program is an hour long, and we will first hear from our panelists about the health of our aging population. What are their challenges, and how are those challenges changing over time? How do we measure up compared to other wealthy nations when it comes to aging well? Next, we'll take a look at what the research says about maximizing health and wellness, by which I mean happiness, social connectedness, and life quality in an advancing age. As time allows, we will take questions from the studio and also from the online audience. Let's start with Lisa Berkman. Uh, can you give us a sense of what it means to age in America today? What does our aging population look like and how is it distinct from previous generations? How do we measure up internationally and what are some of the challenges there? Sure, thanks Meredith. So I'm going to open this with I think three facts that I'd like you um, to think about and there are three facts that in a sense we all know already, they may not be new, but I often say to people that you don't really know them till you start to think about them. So the first one is if we could have the slide that shows um, results from a National Academy of Science panel of which I was a member that looks at life expectancy over the last 30 years in the United States and along with a number of other OECD countries, all pretty well wealthy industrialized countries. <laughs> and one of the things you notice is that we now rank at the bottom of OECD countries in terms of life expectancy. Um, this wasn't true 30 years ago, it wasn't true 50 years ago. We were never at the top, but we were in about the middle of those rankings. And over time, what's happened is that every other country, virtually every other country in this diagram, has improved substantially and we've improved a tiny bit. So life expectancy in the United States has improved over time, but it's improved so much less than almost all other countries that we're now left behind. So this panel actually sought to understand why that happened, and that's something that will come back to you. But sort of fact number one is that we rank at the bottom of OECD countries in terms of life expectancy today, and this wasn't true 30, 40 years ago, and it's especially true for women whose life expectancy has virtually stagnated over this time. The second fact is that there's an enormous disparity in life expectancy within the United States. So while the best off, most educated, wealthiest Americans have continued to experience increases in life expectancy, those at the bottom have not only stagnated, but in some cases have actually lost years of life expectancy over time. So less educated women have lost life expectancy over time, their mortality rates have increased over the period. This is virtually unknown in most Western industrialized countries. The places where we see these kinds of things happen have been with the AIDS epidemic in sub-Saharan Africa or in Russia as the um, former Soviet Republic became a set of independent countries and life expectancy plummeted in many cases. So this is something that we also have to come to grips with, that the widening equalities that we see in the United States are growing over time, not decreasing. The third fact that I wanna talk about has to do with aging societies. That is, across the world, we are all becoming aging societies, demographically speaking. By 2020, there will be more people in the United States who are over 65 than there are under 15. This is the first time this has happened 
globally. And actually, it's going to happen in China about a decade earlier. And it's happened already in many European countries. It's the result of falling fertility rates. So as fertility declines, you have a smaller number of young people. And as we see increases in life expectancy. So the coupling of increases in life expectancy with decreases in fertility produce aging societies. And one of the things that is really important to think about is that this is not a problem. This is something that virtually every society has worked for over the last 50 years. We all want to live longer. Nobody is like volunteering to have a decrease in life expectancy to produce a less aging society. Most people think that drops in fertility are also very healthy and have allowed women to join the workforce, have produced healthier children, and overall healthier societies. But it does mean that we have to really rethink in a fundamental way what we think of and how we work and how our societies will structure opportunities for people. So I'll close with two sets of issues for us all, I think, to be talking about, and I know you'll all pick up on it. One of them is it's really important for us to understand what causes this drop. We want to know how come we're doing poorly compared to other countries. Even well-off Americans don't compare well to best-off Europeans in many cases. What are, what are the forces driving that? <coughs> Behaviors, social conditions, physical environments, healthcare. And the second thing that we want to think about is how can we structure society to take advantage of an aging society? How can we rethink our basic institutions so that they're fundamentally adaptive and responsive to an aging society. And we move beyond kind of the policies that we put in place in the 1940s or the 1950s when people lived a year longer than Social Security um, was. So we need to rethink both ends of that. Thanks. Thanks to you. And now taking it a bit more to a micro level, uh, Francine, I'd love to hear from you a bit about your work with cognition. I think one of the um, m m first things that people think about when they think about aging um, is the actual experience of, of shifting abilities and challenges throughout time. Yeah, so uh, as Lisa mentioned, I mean, our society is aging quite rapidly, and there are a large and growing number of older people um, in our society today. So the, the work I do really focuses on understanding how people can age healthier. Um, so how we might maintain our memories longer, since especially memory is one of the biggest concerns of people as they age. Um, but we also do look more broadly at how we can maintain very general health and well-being. Um, so we look at how people's lifestyle might affect the likelihood that they get older um, and do or don't maintain their memory, um, avoid uh, depression, avoid chronic diseases, um, and maintain their, their physical function, so their ability to get around, do their own food shopping, take care of themselves on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so that is the primary question that um, I look at in the context of the Nurses' Health Study, um, which is a, a large study of women who we've tracked over several decades um, so that we really can understand how their lifestyle impacts their health as they get older. And um, finally, William, there, can you please talk a little bit about, I know you study the molecular pathways that underpin the aging process. Um, and at the risk of sounding glib, I guess what I'd love to hear is, aging truly inevitable? Um, are our lifespans at, at maybe as plastic as we like to believe? And you know, what's sort of going on on a more micro level even than the individual? So sure. So I mean, I, I think I would like to touch upon a bit something that Lisa was saying is that, that we are an aging population. So globally we're aging. And this is, this is a good thing in many ways, except for it does present really severe problems for public health in the terms of the sort of diseases we're getting with age and the burden of age related disease. And what I'd like to talk about is how I think we need to rethink how we target those diseases and how we work biomedically to try and treat them. So if you think about why we're managing to live to later ages now compared to 100 years ago, this is really all public health. So this is all because we've cured in many ways or at least reduced the burden of early infant mortality or worked on infectious diseases which reduced our um, aging population in 100 years ago. And that worked very successfully. So we could look at one disease, work out the mechanisms behind that disease and work out how to treat them. But the way we get disease when we're old is very different from those infant mortalities and those public health problems is that when you're old, 
you don't tend to just get one disease in isolation, you have several different comorbidities. So in fact, the way the whole way our biomedical research is set up in terms of even the way that NIH is structured is we think very disease centrically and we try and work out the proximate mechanisms of one disease. If we can understand those, try and develop therapeutics to treat that disease in isolation. But what I try and do in our research and, and people in my field is think, well, if you just manage to cure completely one disease in old age, because of this comorbidity problem, you actually don't have such a huge effect on, on healthy aging as you might expect. You're still left with those other different morbidities. So what we try and do is, is, as you mentioned, is work on really the commonality between those diseases, which is really the aging process itself and the genetic reasons why animals and people are more likely to get disease in old age than where they're young, and see if we can work out if we can treat those fundamental processes as a way to maybe have a broader impact on multiple disease phenotypes. So really is aging plastic? And there's a lot of evidence, evidence from model systems, including some of the ones that we work on in my lab, and in fact, aging is quite a plastic thing. So not chronological age, I can't do anything about how old we are, but physiological age, animals can actually change their sort of rate at which they age in response to changes in the environment. And you can try and understand the genetic pathways underlying those responses to try and then have a, a broader impact on multiple different, different disease pathologies in old age. So that's the sort of research we're trying to work on. Great, great. Well, as we're still waiting for Dr. Pearls, um, oh, fantastic. Okay, so we'll take a, a quick break to get Dr. Pearl set up and then we'll be right back. As we mentioned before, this is Thomas Pearls. He's the director of the New England Centenarian Study and a professor of medicine at Boston University School of Medicine. Um, and Thomas, I'm hoping that you can speak a little bit about uh, centenarians, an extremely rarefied group of individuals, obviously. Um, so you see trends in aging that are quite different from the average geriatrician and I'm hoping you can talk a bit about your research. <laughs> Well, not so rare anymore, interestingly, in part because of the public health measures that you just spoke about. Um, centenarians were nearly unheard of in the 1800s. And then around 1900, we started to see some remarkable events in public health with a cleaner water supply, making um, dents in uh, causes of mortality in particularly young people. Um, but then with the onset of vaccines, um, more years of education actually around 1915, that made a huge dent in, in terms of um, people making better choices, better access to health care and so on. Um, and then vaccines, better care of blood pressure later um, in the 1970s in particular, we started to see these huge bumps not only in the number of people surviving into adulthood, but then later the number of people surviving beyond the age of 85. So when we started our centenarian study, actually while I was here at Harvard, um, we had about one per 10,000 in the population as a centenarian or a person who lives to 100 or older. And then just recently that has doubled uh, to one per 5,000. Um, and that still is a pretty rare group but they end up being among the fastest growing segments of our population, um, which speaks to the fact that it isn't all genetic, because if it was all genetic, then we wouldn't be seeing these changes. And I think what it means is that a um, significant chunk of our population has the opportunity, or if you will, they're built for the opportunity to become 100. I'm guessing from our genetic studies in which we compare our centenarians against people, just the normal population, that maybe even about 20% of the population has the genetic wherewithal to get to 100. Um, we have, and, and then I guess the next question is, is well, would you want to live to be 100? And um, some people think that these age-related diseases they just keep uh, increasing in prevalence and incidence with the older and older we get. But the centenarians are kind of a select survivor group that they couldn't get to these most extreme ages if they really had, if they had diseases associated with high mortality, they all, those people die at younger ages. So what we have found is that people who live to say 105 and older, now we're talking real rarefied, these people markedly compress the time that they're sick towards the very end of their lives. And if you look at people who live to 110, what we call super centenarians who are one per five million in the population, um, 
those individuals only spend about the last five years of their lives um, with disability and diseases. It's really remarkable, but it fits this hypothesis that's been well known for a long time in the gerontology circles of this compression of morbidity that as you approach the limits of lifespan, you necessarily have to compress the time that you're sick towards the end of your life. So these people are the oldest ones that we're most interested in, in terms of this ability to probably very slowly age and avoid or delay diseases associated with aging. We're not studying them to get a lot of people or hope to get to a lot of people to 110. It's to see what we can do to get a lot of people to live to whatever their uh, their, I guess I would say, blueprint or their DNA is destined to get them to, but to try and live as much of that time in good health as possible. And uh, some of that is genetic, but certainly a great deal of that is health-related behaviors. And we don't look to the centenarians for guiding us about health-related behaviors, because some of them have awful health-related behaviors. <laughs> but they have genes that make up for it, probably. And we're really interested in these protective genes. Maybe that'll translate to something in the future in terms of strategies, screening, even medicines, who knows. But the Seventh-day Adventists, I'll just two more minutes, is the Seventh-day Adventists are this population that have the highest life expectancy in this country that I know of, which is amazing. It's almost 89 years, um, or 90 for women and 86 or 87 for men. And what, they're a very heterogeneous group. Um, they live all over the place, different ethnicities, races. But what they have in common are some really healthy behaviors. And so I think it's this incredibly good news and very empowering that if you're basically vegetarian, don't smoke, don't drink, regularly exercise, do things that help manage your stress well. The Seventh-day Adventists do this with spending a lot of time with family and religion maybe that most of us should be living almost 30 years beyond the age of 60. That's what I think most humans are capable of doing. And to do most of that, like the centenarians, getting there because of good health habits and therefore compressing the time that they're sick towards the end of their lives. If we all did that, it would just be a huge, huge impact on quality of life, quality of aging, and the overall health of the population. So speaking about quality of life and quality of aging, um, since most of us are not super centenarians, most likely, um, the health behaviors are do, do come into, um, into play quite a bit. And we actually have a clip um, that we can play that's uh, from AOL. We're going to stream it. Um, and it's, uh, it sort of deals with some of the um, intellectual engagement and cognitive activity that can help to, um, to make for, for better later years. So let's watch. <laughs> I don't take anything too seriously. Get some weird things here. Here he's talking to the soap, and then the next panel he's talking to this toothpaste. Oh, the handle. For all your soap, he's got the soap here. Right. Mainly, I'm just working on it. I'm whatever I see, whatever I hear, I'm trying to make a joke out of it. Shouldn't that be soap? Say, so, come on, soap. Let's go to the next sink. So I carry around a little book with me when I'm traveling, and I somebody says something, I write it down. I read three newspapers every day. I get ideas in the middle of the night. I get them early in the morning. I get all the ideas all day long. I think trying to think up ideas is an exercise for your mind. And they said that's the best thing for Alzheimer's. It's like uh, jogging or something else. You know, I keep my mind jogging. And uh, I, I think that keeps me young and alert. I love deadlines. As long as you're not dead by the time they come. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right. You're as old as you think you are. You know, I, I know people yeah, I I, I grouse about being old problems. when they're, you know, in their 50s. Okay. Take a panel. You think back through history, 40 was an old age at one time. You didn't live beyond 40. See, this was for the National Cartoonist Society the new album. Directory, yes. In 60, you know, forget it. Okay, I'm going to take these down and read them. Okay. But here I am at 80, and I feel just as alive and productive and energetic. Yeah. So I think um, one way that conversations about aging go is to look at some of the um, anecdotal evidence that's out there. So you know, people who sort of have lived 
long, successful lives, what they do, um, and uh, extrapolating that. And I'm wondering, um, when someone comes to you and, and says, I'm doing all of this, these puzzles and mental exercises to keep going, and, um, and Francine, maybe this is a question for you, you know, what is your response in terms of how that bears out in the data? Is, is there a connection between, between sort of an active work life and, and advanced age that's healthy and well? Um, well, there is certainly plenty of evidence that people who have higher levels of education um, are less likely to develop dementia. Um, there's quite a lot of evidence you know, to, to show very clearly that the, the higher level of education people have, the less likely they are um, to eventually have dementia. Um, and obviously, a large question is, well, you know, I mean, nobody thinks that sitting in a classroom prevents dementia. <laughs> um, so the question is, what is it about education that, you know, seems to confer this, you know, substantial protection against developing dementia? Um, and, you know, so one possible answer is this, you know, sort of use it or lose it idea. Um, that people have more education, you know, tend to um, have, you know, jobs throughout much of their life which require more, you know, sort of uh, intellectual activity and perhaps they also engage in leisure activities which require more intellectual activity. So one explanation for this education effect could be you know, engaging in mentally stimulating activities. Um, and there's a, a small amount of evidence that suggests that engaging in mentally stimulating activities could be one of the answers to why education seems to be so, you know, good for our brains. Um, but we really don't know why. Um, so, you know, certainly people who enjoy doing crossword puzzles should keep doing them. <laughs> But, but there is not solid, clear evidence linking, you know, doing a crossword puzzle to avoiding getting dementia. But I mean, there's certainly plenty of people working on and trying to understand if that might be the answer, but it's, it, we don't know yet. And I, I called on Francine, but any of you are welcome to jump into the conversation to just talk about intellectual engagement in the context of well, I'd add to that we haven't really seen any particular pattern with the centenarians, though um, there is a group that we look at because you've I've heard, for example, centenarians who ha speak multiple languages, or who, or who have played a musical instrument all their life, and we're key we're hearing that pop up enough that we're getting interested in trying to systematically look at that more carefully. Um, but I've heard neuropsychologists liken this a little bit to um, what, they, what one can do to enhance their functional reserve. And just like weightlifting, you can do the, the small weights and, and not do the Sunday New York Times crossword, but maybe the Monday. But uh, some neuropsychologists will say the real heavy weights for like strength training your brain would be like learning a musical instrument or learning a new language, the stuff that is really hard. But isn't it interesting that as you get into it, it gets easier. And, some, and that may be that you are producing new connections that weren't there before. And that could be building functional reserves so that if there is a dementing process in your future, you'd have to deal with more connections before you clinically see it. So it may not be that you can avoid the disease, that these things may help you delay them, though. There is a lot of controversy whether some of these games that are being marketed on computers and what have you can help with that. And I think the one question is, is becoming really good at a crossword puzzle, does that help you know how to find your keys? So translating one into the other is very controversial. The other is, is that there's two different kinds of d Alzheimer's, which is the most common form of dementia. There's an early onset that is really strongly genetic. And there's no evidence that doing even lots of years of education can interfere with the onset of something like that, where those, the more later onset that can still have a familial component may have a, a little bit of wiggle room in at least trying to delay the onset of the disease through this functional reserve idea.
Maybe I could just respond a little bit to that sure. because I think you made both really important points and actually the story that we saw is a wonderful story because part of what he did is continue to work. And so he wasn't doing a short-term repetitive single thing. He was not learning a crossword puzzle or memorizing 10 words or a silly game. He was engaged in a very active life and very fulfilling. And he also had a lot of flexibility about it, right? So he is a person who can choose probably when he wants to work and has a lot of flexibility and control. And those kinds of things coupled with some of the evidence, I think, on retirement these days, suggests that staying at work longer um, and continuing to be socially engaged means that you pull on this large variety of intellectual and cognitive tasks that may help to continue your cognitive involvement. And in societies where, where retirement is early, actually you see sooner some faster and steeper cognitive declines. So this is a very new area, um, really promising. But I think when you think about work and certainly this story and what we were talking about, um, when people designed work, they didn't design it for us to not work for 30 years afterwards. You know, from 60 to 95 was not like a 30-year vacation where what would we do? But so we, so we as a society, again, have to rethink how we are going to stay socially engaged and mentally engaged and contribute in that way. So that story was just lovely from that perspective. And I'd be interested to hear also just a bit of the application. Obviously, if you're a cartoonist, there's an ability to work beyond a certain age, right. but that's not necessarily true for all professions. And so who really benefits from hearing about this kind of research and, and, and the, the process of active engagement? What aspects of that can apply to anyone regardless of profession? So just maybe a quick response, and then we'll turn it over. It's, there, are, there are two ways, two p sort of paths to this. There is some evidence that even working in a factory and a plant um, doing um, kind of blue collar work, but being engaged in your workforce is very promotive of these tasks too. So this is not just an intellectual task for people who are best educated. Um, it can be broadly applicable to a lot of people across society who are engaged in their workforce. But they do have to have some flexibility. And at the same time, there has to be an out for people who really have some kind of disability and can't, can't continue to work. So the idea partially about increasing retirement age would be that there are two paths so that people who really have disability who've had very hard careers who've like maybe work construction like they've had enough right they can't keep doing the kind of work that they're doing um, and they'll need to think about retirement but that other people who really haven't had such physically demanding jobs can retool and reskill and increase their flexibility and those people can, can continue to work in a number of uh, ways for much, much longer than we're thinking now. Great. Well, I think actually this is a really nice uh, seg into the second clip, um, also streaming from AOL. Um, and uh, that clip talks a little bit more about the um, something that, that, you, that you all mentioned, Lisa mentioned in particular, which is the social connectedness and, and um, finding new ways to engage in the community. So if we can play that. I'm 92 years old. 28 years of teaching, besides the substitute teaching that I did after I retired. And I've led a very active life. Church, American Legion Auxiliary, senior citizens, a couple organizations that I belong to, and I just keep going. Well, I had nothing else to do. You know, I'm outside of playing cards and going to bingo and reading. They said that they needed teachers to help the refugees, and I thought, well, I had all kinds of time. I think what we need to do as a society is to create a range of opportunities for people so that engagement is an option all along the aging process, not just for people who are at the peak of their vitality, but also for people who are trying to remain connected to society, who want to avoid being isolated, who've read the research which shows that having a reason to get up in the morning and strong ties to other people are absolutely essential for sustained physical and mental well-being. Good. Now we do this, and then we do it like that. I never knew what I was going to get into. 
What are you? What are you going to be? No, I'm going to be a little bit. What are you going to be? I'm a grandfather. Grandfather. So that really nicely mirrors actually what you were saying, Lisa. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, uh, are there, is this something that we're seeing in, in policy outcomes? Are there programs to sort of engage um, people past retirement um, on this level in a social context? That, uh, I don't know if anyone can speak to that, but yeah. no. There are some, there are not many. <laughs> so there are a few programs where people have thought about um, flexibility in retirement. Um, there are some large companies that have started to experiment with this kind of um, workforce. And um, actually, some of the data from that um, clip, which is some of it's related to experience core, shows that volunteering and staying socially engaged can continue to maintain cognitive um, kind of abilities into older ages. But we've just scratched the surface. I would say we've not nearly maximized what we could be thinking about in terms of redesigning work, redesigning educational experiences, redesigning how families live together. We're just, you know, looking at the tip of the iceberg here. How does social engagement and um, the more intellectual engagement of, of the actual work differ in terms of um, preventing cognitive decline or interacting in, in any way with that? What's the distinction? Well, I, I can speak more at the local level. I was sure live in a town west in Massachusetts and I entirely agree that in terms of a uh, from a more statewide nationwide kind of perspective these programs are greatly wanting but I think at the local level in the towns that I'm familiar with like Weston, Wayland, Lincoln each has these councils on aging and they make it a priority to engage all the elders in the town to do, come up with all kinds of programs to engage them intellectually, to come up with intergenerational programs. Um, I know that my kids have had frequent visits uh, facilitated by the Council of Aging, both from the elders coming over to the uh, middle school and to the lower grades and back and forth. There's a lot going on, I think, at the local level and most people if they know about their councils on aging, know about these efforts. I, th I think those are very important. I think it would be surprising to some people to learn that um, intellectual and social engagement can have an actual physical benefit um, in, the, in the sort of delay of disease onset. And so, um, you know, I'm wondering if maybe, um, William, you can talk a bit about how that might sort of work. So, I mean, I, I think, I'm trying to think about, um, Things you can do behaviorally to try and prolong your healthy lifespan. I think one of the, the central things that we've learned from, a, from the basic science is not so much just cognition, is, is really the links between environment more broadly and diet maybe and longevity. So, so you know, as Tom said, not many of us are lucky enough to have the genes to be able to have a, a bad lifestyle and live to 110. So the goal of the sort of research we do is can we find links between environmental changes in model organisms to try and give us all a chance to sort of squeeze that disease period to later in life. And one of the, the most fundamental things that we found in basic research is actually the link between diet and longevity. And, and in some ways, this, this couples to sort of the, the loss of life expectancy and obesity and, and, and aging. So one of the most striking things in terms of plasticity of aging is that if you take almost any organism, so whether it's a, a single-celled organism or a fruit fly or a mouse or, or a primate, and instead of letting it live exactly the lifestyle it wants and just eat as much food as it wants, if you reduce its food intake just by 20 to 30%, so not malnourishment, just a bit of dietary restriction, it actually has a very pronounced increase in its healthy aging. So it not only lives longer, but it lives much healthier and is resistant to multiple forms of age-related pathology. So in terms of cognition, if it's a, if it's a mouse on dietary restriction, it performs much better in cognitive tests, it becomes resistant to neurodegeneration, but it's also protected against cancer and other different diseases. And so one thing we can do, I wouldn't advocate that as a, as a therapeutic, but trying to understand the molecular mechanisms of that response, so how linked to the environment, how animals can sense their 
environmental conditions and actually alter their ageing rate and their protectiveness against the disease. And if we can understand those molecular mechanisms, perhaps we can try and find targets which make us all slightly more resistant and, and sen super centenarian-like without really getting it. So I think certainly there's a link between, you know, not so much in my, in my term cognition, but in terms of the environment and nutrition and how that relates to these multiple outputs. Nutrition, I think, is, I'm really glad you brought that up because I think that's such a central, that's an actionable thing that everyone can understand and do. Um, and to what extent do you think nutrition really factors into um, a lot of these things? I mean, I understand what you're saying on the molecular level, but just in terms of what foods are good to eat, what foods are not good to eat. Um, I know that there was recently the wonderful research that you did, Francine, on the Mediterranean diet um, and how that relates to uh, to age outcomes? Um, yeah, so I mean, we do clearly know that nutrition is very important for health. Um, and, and as well said, I think it is important um, not just to think about memory or dementia, but really as we age, to think much more broadly about overall health and well being. Um, and, you know, so we have done quite a lot of work in the nurse's health study, um, tracking people's diets over time and then seeing how that impacts their health. Um, and some of the most recent work we've done um, has been, you know, in the exact path that Will was mentioning, um, where we don't just look at one disease. Um, we, we look at people who, although they haven't reached 100, really have aged well. Um, so they've survived to other ages, have no major chronic diseases, um, so no diabetes, no cardiovascular disease, no cancer. Um, they have maintained good memories. Um, they have good mental health. Um, and in addition, they have good physical function, so they're able to get around and take care of themselves each day. And we look at all of those things together. We don't look at any single piece of it. We try to understand what can people do to really achieve you know, that, that big picture of getting older and really staying healthy and happy um, in multiple dimensions. Um, and we have seen that the diet, you know, does seem to make a difference. Um, so the most recent work we did, um, we saw that a Mediterranean diet, so that's a diet high in fruits and vegetables, um, high in um, unsaturated fats, so olive oil, canola oil, um, low in red meat and higher in fish, um, that people who maintain that kind of a diet did live longer, healthier, happy, happier lives. Um, and we've seen that for other parts of diet as well. We've done some interesting recent work um, on flavonoids. Um, for example, uh, berries are very high in a particular kind of flavonoid that seems um, you know, to promote health and well-being with aging. And you know, the link to that too is um, body weight. Um, so one of the first things that we looked at when we were trying to understand how people could age, um, you know, with overall health and well-being was body weight and obesity. Um, and there's an incredibly strong link. So, you know, the more, you know, the higher our body weight or body mass index, the less likely we are to live older, healthier, happier lives. So it's, you know, it's the links between diet and, our, and body weight. Um, so I, I think there's actually, you know, these are answers we already know. <laughs> so I thought it was kind of interesting that you actually started out saying, you know, diet was such an easy thing for people to target and change. Um, and, you know, may, may not be so easy. Um, but, you know, I think it is clear that, you know, having a, a healthy body weight and a healthy diet you know are probably extremely important in terms of how our environment you know can interact with our you know so maybe our, our blueprint <laughs> yeah. I, I would just add I completely with ev agree with everything that, that was just said the other thing that comes up when the discussion of diet are nutritional supplements and people are very interested in these for aging and, and let me say this in the backdrop of what has become a multi-billion dollar industry and a terrible, in my opinion, piece of legislation called the Dietary Supplement Health Education Act from 1994 that pretty much enabled this deluge 
of marketing and God knows what ending up on these uh, uh, nutritional supplement store shelves and, and various marketplaces. And um, you know, there are a number of ver very well-known published studies in high-tier journals like the New England Journal of Medicine and JAMA to indicate that even just a multivitamin, it does you no good that we all generally have a pretty good diet that gives us the vitamins and minerals that we need. And yet, you know, this is just pushed by an incredibly wealthy now industry. There are a number of supplements that I think doctors advocate for that I would back up, which would be things like calcium and vitamin D to prevent osteoporosis. And we already heard about things that are like three omega fatty acids. Um, and then from a medical point of view, it's not a supplement, but maybe an aspirin a day if your physician says that's okay. But beyond that, claims about things like ginkgo biloba, um, vitamin E, which was recently in news, you see these things, first it's good for you, then it's bad for you, then it's good for you. Another one we hear about is selenium. Um, in my mind, I think it's nonsense until, until proven otherwise. Um, and I just think it's a lot of marketing. You can take that to the extreme of not just these nutritional supplements, but things like growth hormone and testosterone. In the case of growth hormone, I'll tell you that is a pure scam, this idea that it helps stop or reverse aging or that it's even good for athletes in terms of improving their uh, performance. The risks of these uh, hormones, which can be highly uh, I would say toxic. I see these toxic hormone soups being promoted by the anti-aging industry. You have to avoid those things like the plague and it's just all really bad for you and, and very aggressive marketing. Please stay away from it. Um, I might just sort of add maybe one thing um, that, you know, I think some of the, the studies that Tom has mentioned have been, you know, studies that are not of incredibly long duration. And I think, I, I, you know, I, I don't think we have incredibly clear evidence that we should be, you know, taking every vitamin supplement out there. But I don't think I would actually say that it's, it's complete nonsense. I think there's still a lot of work to do to better understand um, vitamin supplements. And we certainly want to make sure that false claims aren't being made and that people don't have too much hope, um, you know, on a false basis. Um, but I do think there's a lot of more research that needs to be done in the field of vitamin supplements until we really understand what, what might help and what might not help and also how long we might need to take a supplement before it helps or, you know, or maybe still doesn't help. Um, so it is important that we continue to do a lot of research in this area and be sure that any claims that companies made or beliefs that people had are, are really well documented. So I'll follow up the debate. Just <laughs> to say that I think there's a lot of claims that are being made about these things improving people's health or their aging or being essential. And, and I, I am the per of the personal view that until there's pretty good proof for it that there really isn't, it's at least burning a hole in your wallet. And if you're, if, if you're uh, peeing green <laughs> because of the supplement you're taking, it's probably your kidney getting rid of it because you don't need it. Uh, that may be a very simplistic view, but I, I would rather see some pretty good proof for these things before they're highly marketed and people are taking them rather than it being the other way around. Well, let's assume it's not bad for you and it and it's okay to take. Well, I think um, we, we have about 10 minutes left in the cast and so we'd love to take some questions. Um, we have some online questions if you'd like. Yes, to we do and we have a lot of people online uh, from Costa Rica, India, Hawaii, all warm places so we'll try to get to some of those. Um, but I'll start with this one. A lot of questions have been coming in about nutrition and I think we covered a lot of that so I'll take this. What have we learned from countries and societies that have created effective systems to address a growing aging population? What are the barriers in the U.S. to make the changes we need? Try to 
try Jump first, in. and uh, <laughs> and then maybe others will have another opinion. I think there are a lot of countries that do better than we do. Um, as a matter of fact, if you l remember the first chart, there are at least 22 OECD countries that do better than we do. Um, we're now surrounded in terms of life expectancy between Costa Rica on one side and Chile on the other. Um, if you look at our closest partners in life expectancy. So it's interesting to think about what Costa Rica did um, and what other countries in Latin America are doing as well as countries um, like Japan where life expectancy is you know, just about 90. It's almost like your centenarian um, or your maximum life expectancy kind of um, scenario. And I think in all those cases they've invested in some social structures that make a lot of sense. They've heavily invested in education. Costa Rica, for example, is a country that's invested in education and public health, and not, for instance, in military um, spending. And it's made an enormous difference for a little island that really, in terms of its economic um, well-being, is way, way low compared to where its life expectancy is. Um, so it, I think there are lots of lessons like that. Um, by and large, I think um, working, when we rethink work, so in Japan and countries like that where people think about more workplace flexibilities, um, those are possible. Mostly I think we haven't begun to imagine what the world looks like. Um, and it's here, it's not a future scenario. It's like the future is, is, is upon us and we've hardly imagined it. We mostly think of it um, according to the structures that we put in place in 1940s or 1950s, and then, you know, hoped it all went away. <laughs> Thank you. If I can, I'm just going to take another question because I know we have a lot of them, um, and I know everyone can then take an opportunity maybe to respond to some of these separately. This is from one of our viewers in Hawaii. Can you explain how telomeres lengthen and improve the quality of human life? I can take that one. So, so I mean, telomeres, for those who don't know, are, are sort of the caps on the end of your chromosomes. So if you think about your shoelaces, they have a plastic endpoint to the shoelace which stops those shoelaces fraying. And telomeres are sort of the molecular equivalent of that at the end of a chromosome. So every time your cell divides, you lose a little bit at the end of the, of the chromosomes, and the telomeres are a way to keep them from getting shorter. And as they, there's some evidence, in, certainly in some cell types, that in a, in a lab condition, that uh, there comes a point where the chromosome becomes so, sh so short that the cell enters some sort of senescent phase and starts to sort of basically become a kind of old cell. And I think um, there are certainly links between telomeres and, and, and enzymes which can keep the ends of those chromosomes long, so can increase the, the length of those um, telomeres with age in terms of reversing some of those senescent phenotypes in the, in the lab and in the, in the cell culture. I don't think yet we know if there's any particular links between telomerase and, and sort of human aging on, an, on a sort of more organismal level. I think from a cellular level, they're very critical, and I think it's one part of the process we need to look at. And in fact, some of the interventions which make model systems in the laboratory age sort of better have an effect on those telomeres. But I think as with aging is a complicated thing, it's not just due to one thing. So I would say it's, it's part of a, a multifactorial process. And so I'm wondering if we can invite the audience here, if any of you have any questions that you'd like to ask. Please go ahead. My name is Fuchs I'm from Brazil. I'm a visiting professor at the Brigham in the sabbatical. I'm, I have a question to Dr. Perls. Uh, one biological thing that uh, is the matter that I work on that you referred before that may be a part of the solution or the prevention, the key for that, that blood pressure, your, the main reason to have health blood vessels. My question is, how, how is how, uh, the blood pressure of the people from the centennial study? Because they are from different backgrounds, education, uh, st uh, lifestyle, and so on. Huh? They appear every, everywhere in the world. They do have a low blood pressure, uh, most of them at least, or not? So the centenarians generally, um, on average, are pretty healthy. Um, even if they have some age-related diseases, on average, they're on just three medications. Um, and, and usually not a blood pressure medicine, and they do run blood pressures on the low end. Um, there's even a segment of the population that seems to crave salt, which is interesting. 
where they're really low, running low blood pressures and they have a lot of salty food and they're in great shape. We hear about how salt's bad for most people and um, it can be bad for a segment of our population. It's just for this select group, some of them seem to do well with it, well with it. but you're right. Generally speaking, they run blo low blood pressures around 100 to 110 systolic. Hi, um, I have a quick question about social engagement. You guys talked about that a lot, and I, th I think it's really important. Um, but I'm wondering, how does that apply to introverts or people with social anxiety, like who would really much rather, you know, would be much happier to be alone? And I don't know if you've done any studies on that, but how does that play out in, in healthy aging? Uh, you may have some examples. Well, <laughs> Do you want to go and then all? You know, there's work on personality <laughs> testing. And um, at least in the centenarian studies, um, when you test personality, you look at these five different domains, conscientiousness, agreeableness, um, neuroticism, openness, and extroversion. And um, there's a number of studies uh, more in the general aging literature as well that have connected at least extroversion with being <laughs> associated with better aging, which is a little bit opposite than the introversion that you've mentioned, which people have equated with more social engagement, um, having friendships, maybe even helping establish a social safety net for yourself that if you find yourself in trouble, there's other people to rely on. Um, and, and this notion that we saw in the video of having a cause that gets you up in the morning um, wouldn't necessarily, I think, be associated with an introvert, but maybe there's a cause that's important to them by themselves. I don't know, but that at least if you would think of extroversion as being the opposite of introversion, I think the extroversion has been associated with um, better aging. I'm not aware of the opposite being associated with worse aging, however. The other feature that people commonly look at is neuroticism. People who are neurotic, kind of like Woody Allen, I would say, who are, uh, they um, are always worried. They seem to internalize their stress. What we find with many of the centenarians and particularly their kids is it isn't the amount of stress that it's important. It's how they manage their stress. So they can, for some people, stress is a motivator and, um, and it doesn't seem to get to them. So it, really the key is how you manage your stress. Do you let it get to you or do you do things like exercise or Tai Chi or meditation or engage in religion? People usually know for themselves what helps them feel better in terms of stress. The idea is setting aside the time and effort to manage that stress well. Those are the two personality things I would think of. I would just add that we do know that statistically that people who are socially isolated are at increased risk and that social engagement is one of the very protective kinds of um, social experiences that people have. But it's a statistical association. It doesn't mean everybody who's socially isolated is actually going to experience poor events. And there may be some people who are quite content and really want to be in that spot and are happy. So it's not, it's not you know, a 100% kind of uh, correlation. It's a much weaker correlation than that, with lots of room for people to um, kind of design their lives according to what's best, you know, most comfortable for them. I saw another hand. Thank you. I'm from Ghana. My, my name is uh, Frank Junato. Uh, it's interesting the uh, graph that you show about uh, the aging populations in America, USA, compared to other countries. Um, there must be some systemic pr issues that those countries have put in place that U.S. is not putting in place. Uh, is there, have, have you gone further to find out what kind of systems exist in those countries or what kind of system that the U.S. has put in place that had, is constraining you from living longer? So I, th I, I think that's the million-dollar question, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and we know a little bit and not a lot. So there are some things that we know, like this, this panel looked, for instance, at 
tobacco consumption. Tobacco is one of the things that turns out to be um, very high early on in this, in this age group, especially of women, um, compared to other countries. So there are behaviors that, um, that can explain a part of these differences. But there are a huge number of variables that have to do with, I think, social connectedness, social protection policies, poverty policies, educational experiences, work experiences that could potentially explain the differences um, for it. And that, uh, that is the next step. When I sort of presented this, I, sort of, I like to think like these three things that we pre talked about are facts. Like, that's true, but the solutions or understanding what they are, that's new territory. That's the next phase of work. But there certainly are systems that explain this. It almost has to be um, for that kind of thing to happen over that time period. So we have time for one more question. There's one extra one. Would you like to another from I online? I would, because we do have a lot of questions online. And we've been getting a lot of questions about hormone replacements. What are the pros and cons of hormone replacement in men and women? And then another related question. Do the benefits of taking bioidentical hormones outweigh the risks? We just do have a, a number of these questions that have come in, even on email. Well, I'd like to leave the issue about estrogen replacement to, to my colleague. That that's a real <laughs> important issue with the, with the Women's Health Study. Um, I know quite a bit about the anti-aging industry's pushing of hormone replacement therapy, which um, they basically um, do this, try to do this quick sell where they say, well, hormones decline with aging. And, and people have always, since the 1800s, uh, have equated hormones with youth. And so um, it's an easy sell for these marketers to say, well, these hormones decline with aging, so by simply replacing them, we can stop and reverse aging. And in the case of testosterone, there are anti-aging clinics out there who will say, oh, well, all men have testosterone deficiency and all men should get testosterone. We've seen the androgel ads on TV. And, um, and to me, these are incredibly the whole low T syndrome has been, in my mind, just made up out of thin air. Real clinical hypotestosteronism in men, if you look at the epidemiological studies um, conducted by what I would call responsible researchers, it's about 2% of the male population. Yet the makers of testosterone and the low T um, advertising campaign want people to believe that the huge majority of baby boomer men have low T. And they'll say, do you have depression? Do you have weight loss? Or um, are you losing muscle? Well, that's incredibly common among people who just have obesity or, uh, and it's not because they have a hormone that needs to be replaced. At the same time, they say nothing about what I view as a significantly increased risk for heart attack and stroke for people who are on testosterone. And, and also, we have a big problem with people who get very impulsive and even psychotic on, on anabolic steroids, which is basically different variations of testosterone. Testosterone is the gold standard of an anabolic steroid. So um, you can tell how I feel about testosterone replacement in men. Um, growth hormone I've already discussed. Um, so the, the key there is if one is concerned about replacement therapy in men or women, you'll hear about this, but um, go to a board certified endocrinologist. Don't go to an anti-aging clinic where I've only seen one or two board certified endocrinologists out of all the clinics that exist in the United States for a good reason. They won't, don't want to have anything to do with it. Um, but go to a board certified endocrinologist to see if you really need a hormone or not. You want to speak about women and estrogen replacement? I mean, I, quickly from a very basic research point of view and sort of from my growth hormones, I mean, the striking thing we've learned in the last 20 years is that, in fact, 
there's a very conserved way that we age, whether you're a human or a mouse or a fruit fly or a nematode worm. We tend to age through the same processes and we can perturb some of those same processes and increase healthy lifespan. And what we've learned that the things that actually tend to do that are certainly not giving more growth hormone. They tend to be actually down regulating some of these growth pathways. And I think it's far too early to say if that would be therapeutically beneficial for people, but certainly the idea from the basic research of, of flooding these growth hormone pathways as a protectant against aging is the opposite from what we find in the very basic science. So I wouldn't advocate that. Yeah, I mean, in women, it's a, I mean, I'm sure you've got lots of questions because it's an extremely complicated area. Um, and I don't think we know the exact answer, and probably the exact answer is different for different women. Um, but, so, I mean, to start maybe on the, the pluses of postmenopausal hormone therapy, um, many women do have menopausal symptoms. So when they're beginning to go through menopause, they have very classic symptoms like hot flushes, night sweats. You know, I think most people uh, are familiar with menopausal symptoms and, and what they are. And many women go through them and they can be extremely debilitating to quality of life. Um, and hormone therapy in women remains really the only and best proven treatment for those menopausal symptoms. Um, so certainly for women who are going through menopause and experiencing debilitating symptoms, um, short-term use of hormone therapy at the lowest effective doses can be very important to their quality of life. Um, on the other hand, for many, many, many years now, Hormone therapy has been discussed more in the long term to prevent chronic diseases um, and sort of to promote healthy aging. And that's really where the controversy lies, um, whether or not women should be taking hormone therapy much longer term with the hope that it will maintain their health. And I, I think people are still in general agreement that on average, it hormone therapy probably does not um, promote healthy aging, and it, it does have some harms. Um, it can cause strokes in women. Um, some types of hormone therapy can cause breast cancer in women. Um, in contrast, though, for you know women who have osteoporosis and are at risk of fractures, hormone therapy is a very good treatment. Um, for, you know, specifically for osteoporosis. So some people are beginning to say that, you know, specifically for women at risk of fractures, you might think that, um, you know, some of the b benefits might outweigh those risks. Um, but, you know, I, if, if I were to give one answer, I think it probably is that, you know, the answer is different for everyone and that, you know, you really have to carefully weigh the risks and benefits with the help of your healthcare provider. Um, and in terms of the bioidentical hormones, there's really no long-term research. And given that the concerns we have about hormone therapy are long-term, there is no basis for thinking that the bioidentical hormones are better or, or worse than, you know, sort of the more traditional ones that are on the market. So women shouldn't take bioidentical hormones thinking they're avoiding, you know, the risks of other types of hormone therapies. We really don't know a lot about the long-term effects of the bioidentical hormones yet. I, I, I would say that the vast <laughs> majority of the quote, bioidentical hormones that are marketed by these clinics and others is in fact the real stuff. It's the, it's growth hormone or testosterone that's uh, made by, bio, by genetically engineered bacteria to make the same, it's the same process as we get insulin. It's the real stuff. If there's a few that'll say, well, they're making a hormone out of yams or something as, but they use the term bioidentical as just part of their marketing scheme to make something sound safe. And, and it's the real stuff and it's not safe at all in my opinion. Um, and there's a few that'll do the vegetable stuff but there's no evidence that, as, as has said, that that does anything really. So I think working with your doctor and finding a unique um, treatment or non-treatment is, is a good note to end on. Unfortunately, the forum has come to an end. Um, but you can continue the conversation on uh, forumhsph.org. And I want to thank all the panelists for coming and sharing their research. Um, this is such a pleasure. 
And uh, the next form will be on February 5th um, from 1230 to 1.30, same time. And the topic will be antibiotic resistance. So that should also be a wonderful discussion. So thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.